Don't pay attention to like a lot of it. Just pay attention to the side. This is like more of my notes. Um, and the side is what you can kind of follow along. Uh, you don't have to pay. Don't don't look at uh, don't look at the middle or any of that. Don't worry about it. Just just pay attention to the to the right side and the cross references. Right. I shared this with you guys before. Uh, so we're going to be in, in James chapter 5, uh, verses 7 through 11. But let's read, let's read James chapter 1 through 11. Can someone read that? 5 your riches have rotted, and the garments are moth Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you, and will beat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mold your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He, did, he does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. All right, I'm just going to pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we're so grateful for for the work that you have accomplished on the cross. After you resurrected, uh, you said that it, it was finished, and it was indeed finished. You did indeed uh, save a people from their sin, save a people from, from the wrath of the Father. Uh, so, Lord, we thank you, God, for, for those who are yours. Uh, and, and we thank you, God, for your word and allowing us to come and, and read and and meditate and think on and, and, and talk about your word, O oh Lord. I pray, O oh Lord, that uh, this would not just be another Bible study, but, but it would convict us and it would spur us on uh, to love you more, to live a holier and a, uh, a holier lifestyle, to be more conformed to the image of Christ, uh, to forsake our sin uh, uh, and follow you, O oh God. So I, I pray, O oh God, that, that your spirit would would work in us and convict us and, and apply the word uh, to our lives. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Mm. Alright, so main point of the, this passage is going to be uh, securing your heart, right? And, and during the time of trials and during the time of um, testing, um, we ought to remain p patient. We ought to observe uh, that the Lord is coming and, and seeing that the Lord is coming it should cause us to, to live patient uh, lifestyles uh, and to trust in the work of God to see the compassion uh, that God has uh, bestowed on, on, on a human race uh, and, and, and then that should lead to us not grumbling uh, and then we will see kind of examples through Job and through the prophets and and how they kind of established uh, the Lord in their hearts, and how they uh, endured uh, and were patient in their trials. Um, and I broke it up in three parts. We'll see in verses 7 through 8, we see the uh, where patience should be rooted, and it's in the Lord's coming. Um, we see verse 9, the, the command to not grumble, uh, and then verses 10 to, through 11 we see uh, 
patience exemplified through the prophets and, and through Job. Um, so I, I want to start off by asking, uh, he, he starts off in verse 7, it says, Therefore, and whenever we see therefore, it means that he's, a, he's just mentioned something, um, and, and he's, he's telling us, all right, I just mentioned this, so therefore you ought to live in this manner. Uh, so the question that I want to start off with, what, what was he mentioning before? And what was he speaking of before? If anyone can kind of recall, I know we did this Bible study like a month ago or something like that. Uh, but, but, or you could just look at the previous verses and you'll see it. Not the thing what tomorrow we plan to do Mm hmm. Okay. Anyone else? This remember this passage is about being patient in in persecution, in trials, in oppression. No one else. Well, the, the ritual oppressing the uh, the poor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so that's what we we kind of went over last time. We went over, uh, in the latter par portion of uh, chapter four, we see that there were Christians uh, that were business people, and they were confiding in themselves. They were living lives in a presumptuous manner, and then we kind of see the contrast. We see those who were not Christians and who were rich. And, and we see this in verses four to, uh, 1 through 6. And, and what they were doing is they were oppressing those who were righteous. They were withholding the money and the funds that, that these, uh, these, these laborers worked for. Um, and they were not giving it to them. Or they were giving partial, um, partial monies to them. So the agreement that they agreed upon uh, was not kept. Right? Uh, and this is why James speaks of... Uh, the, the day of the slaughter, these, these business wicked owners, uh, these farmers, uh, they were storing up for themselves stuff. And what they were doing, in, in essence, what they were doing is uh, building up the fat, building up all the goods that they have, all the goods on this earth, and they were storing it up. Uh, and, and it gives us the analogy that what they're actually doing is that they're becoming fat uh, and, and if we know anything about the, the slaughterhouse and how things are slaughtered, uh, the ones that need to be slaughtered, the ones that are good for slaughtering are those that are fat. Uh, and that's what they were doing. They're, they're building up uh, for the day of judgment where they will be slaughtered, uh, where, where they will be condemned for their actions and for the way that they live uh, and, and for oppressing those who are righteous uh, for their greed. Um, so that's kind of what we, we, we see, and, and that's why he says, therefore, right? So, so they're coming out of uh, oppression. They're coming out of being oppressed and going through trials. And what he's saying is, uh, therefore, be patient. Even though you're, you're, you're going through these trials, uh, you, this is the manner in which you, you ought to uh, uh, carry yourself during those trials, So, we, we go from command to command in the book of James. James is constantly condemning uh, certain actions, and then he's following up on the contrast and telling us, okay, don't do this, do this. Uh, and, and here we see the command, and the command is uh, to be patient. And what, what does it mean to be patient? To wait on the Lord. To wait on the Lord. Not take matters in your own hands. Not take matter in your into your own hands. Anybody else? Enduring. Enduring. All right. Uh, those were all good responses. Uh, patience is to be of a long spirit, uh, not to lose heart. Hearts uh, to persevere patiently and bravely, uh, enduring misfortunes and troubles. Um, and we read. In Hebrews 6, 13 to 15, it says, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. 
And so, having patiently waited, uh, that, that is an enduring, uh, that is not losing heart, he obtained that promise. Um, also note that it's, he's addressing this to believers. Uh, and this is important to know that, that he's addressing this to believers. Uh, and uh, now kind of come back to this, this idea of it being to believers. And it being for believers. The verse goes on to say, Until the coming of the Lord. Uh, and and we, we read a lot of scriptures on the coming of the Lord. Um, and how the Lord will come. And this is just one scripture in John 21, 22. Can someone read that? And the cross references are on the bottom. I, I broke them out by verse. Um, they're not all there, but the majority are there. 21, 22? Yes. Jesus said to him, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. All right, so he's, Jesus himself spoke on the, the, uh, the, the coming of the Lord, right? Uh, of himself. Um, so what James is indicating here is he's showing us the duration of how, how, how long we ought to be patient, right? It says until the coming of the Lord. Uh, and what that indicates and what we see through that is that we ought to be patient all of our Christian lives, right? It's till the end, till the coming of the Lord is, is how we ought to be patient. When we're enduring trials, when we're oppressed, when we're persecuted, uh, this is the manner in which we should... We should receive uh, those, uh, those trials and, and that oppression. Right? So in all of our trials, in all of our misfortunes, in all of our trouble, uh, we, ought, we, ought, we ought to remain patient. And based on the context that we, that we kind of read uh, in the previous verses last time, this is not just a general trial. It's, it's a trial that they're facing uh, from other people, right? They're being persecuted and they're being oppressed. Uh, and, and James is telling them, in those times, uh, remain patient, right? Uh, we also kind of see just a more general uh, sense of how we ought to receive trials in James chapter 1. Does anyone remember what James calls us to do in James in James 1? How, how we ought to receive trials? Yeah. Well, joy. Count it all joy, right? It says, count it all joy, my brethren, uh, when you encounter various trials, knowing there's a purpose to the trial, and the, and the purpose to that trial is uh, the testing of our faith, and that it produces endurance, it produces patience. Um, and then it says, and let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Uh, so... From these two verses alone and from the book of James alone, we learn two things. We must receive trials. Generally, we must receive trials uh, in, a, in, in, a joyful, in a joyful way, knowing that our trials are, are, are to build our faith, are to, to cause us to endure uh, the walk more. Um, and then in, in verse 5, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, and it's talking about trials, if you're lacking wisdom during that trial, um, come to God. If you need wisdom in, in overcoming your trial, come to, to the giver of wisdom. Come to the one who gives graciously and who gives without reproach. Right? He does not. God does not withhold anything when He gives uh, when He gives you that wisdom. He gives it to you. Uh, you know, there were, there's no uh, there's no double motives in giving you that. He just gives it to you without reproach um, to those who ask. So that's the first thing we learn. We learn that we must receive it joyfully, and that if we're lacking uh, wisdom to, to endure our trials or or to be joyful, ask the Lord and He'll give it to us. Uh, the second thing that we see is, uh, which we kind of just went over, is that we must be patient in our trials. Uh, by fixing our eyes on the coming of Christ. And, and, and notice that both times they're pointing to Christ. Right? One is saying, if, if, you lack, if you lack wisdom, go to God. Ask God and He'll give you it. And then, and then in these verses, we're, we're, it, it's, James is commanding us 
Be patient in your trial. Be patient when you're being oppressed. And, and when you're being oppressed, fix your eyes on Christ. Um, look toward the, the coming of Christ as an encouragement um, so that you can endure and you can be patient, right? So, so both ways, it's, it's two different aspects of, of Christ and, and the goodness of Christ and gifts of God, um, but they're, they're both ultimately the source in which we ought to go to endure our trials is Christ. Um, we ought to seek Him and, and act of Him. All right. Uh, can someone read Romans? Uh, actually, yeah, Romans eight eighteen. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. All right, and this is going to tie into to, to the verses to the next verses, but this is just saying the sufferings. This is an encouragement that the sufferings of of this time. They shouldn't even be put on, on the same level. Uh, they shouldn't be put on the same level by the, by the glory that we're going to receive uh, when, 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 when Christ comes. Um, there are two different levels. Uh, you, the glory that you're, you're going to receive, the glory that you're gonna be, that's going to be revealed is going to far surpass uh, your trials on this earth. Uh, they're going to far surpass... Uh, the sorrow and the weeping and the sadness uh, because we get Christ and, and this is what we have to look forward. So we ought to be continually reminded of this when we're going through trials. We ought to, con to continually be reminded and continually be praying, Lord, I know, I know that you call me to be patient during this trial. Um, help me to be patient. Help me to act in this manner. Help me to receive trials in this manner. Help me to receive trials in a joyful spirit. Although my, my soul uh, may be disturbed, may be sad, and may be depressed, as we saw, uh, we see all through the Psalms, uh, David is, is sorrowful and depressed. He puts his hope in God, uh, and he cries out to God uh, so that he might help him. And we've also learned that uh, in, in the previous verses, we saw that the righteous, they cry out for help. They cry out when they're being oppressed. And the Lord hears their oppression. And the Lord, uh, the Lord will take vengeance on those who are oppressing the righteous. So know that, that, that God is the one that takes vengeance. That God is the one uh, that we ought to be drawing near to uh, in our moments of trial. In our, in our moments of difficulties on this life. And then the next thing we see is, is, is an analogy. Uh, and it says, The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets, it gets the early and, and, and the late rains. All right, so this is an analogy. He's trying to paint the picture on how we ought to be patient, right? Uh, he's giving us an earthly story and, and trying to drive home uh, the message or, or the command that he's giving us, Right? Uh, or, or he's intending for the recipients of this letter. Uh, and it's, it kind of comes to no surprise because he was the uh, half-brother of Jesus. So a lot of what we see in James, it's kind of mirroring what we see, what we saw in Jesus and the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus gave parables to, to kind of explain, uh, you know, he gave earth, their, their parables are earthly stories to, with, a, with a spiritual meaning. Uh, and I wouldn't say that this is a parable, this is an analogy, but uh, you see kind of a hint of the fact that, that James was, you know, with Jesus the whole time, and, and, and he was influenced uh, by Jesus. So there's a couple things that we can kind of draw from this parable. The first thing that we draw is the farmer waits, right? It says, the farmer waits for the precious produce, Um and that means that the farmer understands how the produce is, be, is, is going to be produced. Uh, it is through time that that, that, that produce is, is going to be produced and is going to grow uh, to where it's at. And he waits, he waits expectantly. He knows. That's why he's waiting. He knows that it's going to grow through time. He's, he, there is an expectancy here. 
uh, and he understands that it, it's a matter of time and it's a matter of certain conditions in which in which uh, his his crops or his produce will grow. Second thing we could see here is uh, he understands uh, that the soil must be healthy, it must be fertile to grow, right? Um, and the last thing we can see is we see that we see the result of of his waiting, um, of, of his understanding of how the, the produce works and how it grows and how the soil must be, uh, and it and it leads to precious produce, right? That is the reward. That is the end goal. Uh, that is what the farmer is aiming toward and waiting for is for the produce to grow and to flourish. Uh, and the word precious here uh, it means held at a great price, right? Uh, so this this analogy is kind of showing us the command that he's calling us to, that James is calling us to. We, we as believers, we have to understand patience. We have to understand what patience is. We have to understand the moments in which James is calling us to be patient. Uh, what produces patience? Right? How, how, how can I be patient as a believer? And in knowing all this, it should lead to, to, us, to, to us waiting expectantly for the gift, for the end result. There's a goal at, in, in mind in all this waiting, in all this being patient, in all this enduring. Uh, and can someone read Galatians 6, 9? And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Amen. Um, so, so this verse is just showing us that it's, it's through time uh, not to grow weary, to be patient, to continue to endure, and, and then we will receive the goal. Uh, we will receive the reward and and that will be that will come from God Himself, and it, it will be God Himself. It's the second coming, right? It's the coming of the Lord. Yes, Bob. Do you have Romans five three on it? No. You want to? You want to? Might as well. What the heck? Go for it. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations work in patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And Hope make it not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Mm. Amen. Thank you for quoting that. All right. Um, so that's verse 7. Let's move on to verse 8. And it says, You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. Um, can someone read Luke twenty one nineteen? By your patience, possess your souls. Right? Or uh, my version says, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. Um, so it is through endurance that we gain this life, that we gain the reward. Um, and, and James here is, again, he's exhorting them. He's commanding them uh, to be patient. He just, he just, he started in verse 7 by saying, uh, be patient. He gave an analogy on how on how farmer is patient, and we can kind of see how how we ought to be patient. And now he's back to it. He's he's telling them be patient. Um, and then it goes on to say, strengthen your hearts. Uh, and this this strengthening uh, it's used in it's First Thessalonians three thirteen. Uh, and can someone read that verse? First Thessalonians three thirteen. Right. So, so here we see that it is God that does the establishing, and 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 what James is com commanding us to do, it it is also a work of God. 
It is looking to the coming of the Lord. That is a work of God. It is looking to the work uh, that is going to come. Uh, and in doing so, uh, we, can, we can endure. We can be patient. Uh, this word strengthen, it's, it's, it, it means to, to make stable, right? To, to place firmly, to set fast, to fix. Uh, and I'm going to read a, a bunch of scriptures that we'll, we'll see this word used in, in different ways. And, and this is what James is, this is how James is calling us uh, to set our hearts and to be patient. Um, can some... Can someone read Luke 16.26? And then Ezekiel 6.2. Luke 16.26? Uh, yes. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed. So that those who wish to come over, come over from here to you, will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. Right. So this this uh, this word "fix" same word that's being used uh, in, in this in, in James chapter five eight. It is it is fixed. Ezekiel six two. The son of man, set your face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them. This word "set," uh, set setting. This idea of setting your face toward uh, the mountains of Israel—that's uh, the same word that's being used in by the uh, in James chapter five, verse eight. Uh, can strengthen. Someone, yeah, strengthen. Uh, Luke twenty-two thirty-two, and can someone read Acts twenty Luke twenty two thirty two. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Again, we see this word. We see it in Acts uh, eighteen twenty three, and it says, "Having spent some time there, he left and passed successively through Galatian region and Phrygia." strengthening all the disciples. We also see it in Romans 1.11, For I long to see you, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. So it's all these different ways uh, that we see this word uh, strengthen. And, and what James is co commanding is a firm adherence uh, to the faith in the midst of temptation, in the midst of trials. And, and as we wait patiently for the Lord to return, uh, believers... We as believers, as Christians, we need to be fortified uh, for the struggle against sin uh, with, within those circumstances and those trials that we face. And then we see, it says, For the coming of the Lord is near. Can someone read First Peter uh, 4, 7? All right, so the first thing we see is the coming of the Lord is, is it's going to do uh, two things, right? One is, 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 a, is a hope. It produces a hope that, that the Lord is coming. And one is uh, a, a healthy fear that, that He is coming uh, and, and that He can come at any moment. And, and the word, the Lord is near, what that word near means is it's just on the edge. Uh, and we know from the framework of salvation, we know that Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ has resurrected, and Christ has said that He will come again. Uh, so that's the last thing uh, that, 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 that we're awaiting for as believers. Um, and this can happen at any time, right? The Lord can come at any moment. Uh, and Jesus proclaimed in, in Mark 
115 that the kingdom of of God is near. The kingdom of God is at hand, right? Uh, And knowing this, as believers, this should cause us to be conscientious uh, about the way that we live, right? Knowing that He can come at any time. uh, And this should kind of impact the way that we make our decisions and choose values based on the reality that He's coming, right? Um, We also read in Romans 13, uh, 11 through 12. It says, Do this, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from, from from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us set aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. So this is this is what it should do. It should cause us to forsake sin, knowing that the Lord is coming. It should cause us, knowing that uh, He can come at any moment. Uh, he goes further, excuse me, he says, I believe, I'm not sure. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for flesh. flesh. Amen. Amen. And the lust thereof. Amen. Um, so, in order to be patient, James is saying, we have to strengthen our hearts. And how do we strengthen our hearts? By looking to the, the, the coming of Christ, looking to the Lord's coming, right? Uh, we must think on and we must be reminded uh, that the Lord is coming. And that is good news for us. That is something that we're longing for uh, and we're waiting for, right? Uh, Titus 2.13, can someone read that? Right? So in this verse, it's described as our blessed hope. As believers, that is, that is our hope. Uh, that is a sure hope uh, that, is, that, that, that we can rest on and rely on and trust in. Um, what, what are other reasons why believers should look forward, look forward toward the, the coming of, of, of Christ or uh, the, the Lord's coming? What are some reasons why we should be looking forward to this? Well, because of uh, heaven, Jesus said, Let not, not, not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, also to believe in me, in my Father's house, many mansions. Not so, I would not have told you so. I have tremendous assurance. I couldn't wait to die when I was 10. <laughs> I would have gone to hell, but I didn't realize that. I think uh, another one is, he who began a good work in you, and Uh, right, the process of 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 a of a believer is justification, sanctification, and glorification. Once the Lord comes, those who are in Christ, they'll be glorified. Um, so that's good. Any other reasons why we should be looking? You forgot adoption. Okay, adoption, justification, regeneration, conversion, saving faith, justification is number four. Adoption. Sanctification and glorification, waiting to wit the redemption of my body. Amen. Uh, what are some other reasons? Sin will be done away with. Sin so will we, be. We deal with sin. I mean, we're forgiven as far as the east is from the west, but we still deal with it. There's consequences for our sins and the sins of the world and sin we deal with daily, but we'll be gone. Amen. Amen. Denise, you want to say something? Anybody else? I would say, um, like now we know in part, the woman with the Lord will know fully to so really understand Lord God. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? All right. Uh, those are all good responses, right? Uh, all those things are true. At the end of history, Jesus is going to come and he's going to deliver the saints. Uh, when we read it, in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 to 23, for in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, uh, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits after those who are in Christ at his coming. Right? Uh, this is what we have to look forward. We're going to be made alive in, in, in Jesus Christ. Uh, his work uh, uh, of redemption uh, is. It's complete. We'll be glorified. Um, we'll have glorified bodies. 
First uh, Thessalonians two nineteen. Can someone read that? And then all these verses that we'll read, it's go it's going to be uh, in Thessalonians. Someone else read First Thessalonians three thirteen. So two nineteen and then three thirteen. So what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting for our Lord Jesus at His coming? Is it not me? Right, so uh, that is our hope, that is our crown. It is at the coming of the Lord. The next verse, can someone read that? What was it? 3 what? 313, 1 uh, Thessalonians. 313. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Amen. Uh, and then, uh, so we see that he establishes our hearts without blame, um, and it and is done at the coming of the Lord, right? Uh, in First Thessalonians four fifteen, it says, "For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep." Um, and then First Thessalonians five twenty three. Can someone lastly read that? Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete, without blame, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right, so all this good news of uh, the, the Lord delivering the saints, the Lord delivering his people. You guys have mentioned some things. Uh, what you were saying, just to put the icing on the cake, it's going to be a general resurrection, and it takes place on an A mill position. In John 5.24, I'll read that, John 5.28, okay? Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which that all in the grave shall hear his voice, and some shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And uh, it goes on on that showing on his coming, what's going to take place that the dead in Christ will be raised and those who are there on the earth will be caught up in the sky. I mean, this uh, uh, the, the three mil is bogus, man. He's not setting up as far as my understanding on a thousand years here. This is showing concrete what's taking place. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so he's going to come as as the savior of his people, right? Uh, and and, and and accomplish and finish mm -hmm. and finalize uh, the delivering of the saints. Mm -hmm. uh, apart from being a savior, what else is he coming as? Judge. He's coming as a judge, right? Uh, let's read Matthew 24, 37 to 39. Right. Uh, so, so there's going to be a judgment, a condemnation on the wicked, uh, and God will judge them with perfect and righteous judgment, uh, with an eternal punishment, uh, and that's what's going to fall on on those who are not in Christ, those who are wicked. Um, and then we also see in Second Thessalonians two eight. Benny, before you go yeah. there, that's Pastor Fry's verse and my verse to show conclusively. Uh, the position that things are not getting better, they're getting worse when you go for, as in the days of the before the flood, we see that it's going to be the same, it's not going to be, uh, this is a little deep for everyone, it's not going to be that post mill, and basically this is what's going to happen there, you see, this is what Pastor Fry will go to to show conclusively this doctrine here, that it's going to be the same 
and basically things aren't getting better. As far as myself is concerned, on my eschatology, things are getting worse and worse and worse, and then Christ comes. And this verse proves it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, within this verse, you also, you can kind of see, um, it says, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Uh, all right, in the days of Noah, uh, there was little concern for, no concern for the things of God. Uh, in the same way we see in James chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, uh, they were fattening, uh, they were storing up stuff for them for themselves, not knowing that they're, they're just, they were just fattening themselves up for the day of slaughter, uh, and that the judgment of God will fall upon, uh, fall upon them. Uh, no concern at all for, 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 for the coming of, of the Lord. Um, they don't even believe it. But it's coming. Um, then the lawless one, first, uh, Second Thessalonians 2 8, then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Right? So, so again, a, a imagery of, of, of judgment coming, um, judgment being unleashed on the wicked. So, on one side, we have those who are being oppressed in this life, right? Those who are being oppressed by, by the wicked, uh, they have a, a sure hope. Uh, and, and that sure hope is found in the coming of Christ, where, where you will be delivered uh, from sin. You will, you will have glorified bodies. You will, you, will, you will also... Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Glorified bodies. You have glorified bodies, right? Uh, and then on the other hand, you'll have the judgment of the wicked, um, where where they'll be condemned for their sin, and and this should be, this should be something that should press on you, right? Uh, you should be concerned for those who are who are who are going to receive this judgment. Uh, you have this blessed hope, don't you want to share this blessed hope with those who are under the the wrath of God? Don't you want? Uh, them to receive this good news and be delivered uh, from their sin and taken out of the bondage of sin and 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 given the freedom of Christ. Uh, this should be pressing to us, um, and and it's a reality. So so we have a hope in the in the coming of Christ, uh, but this should also be sobering uh, that it's coming and it's coming quick and it it can come at any time. And and as one pastor said, either Christ comes. Uh, Christ comes or we go to Him. It, it makes no difference. We're, we're going to get there. Um, and, and, and judgment will be unleashed or, or saints will be delivered. Uh, any comments, questions before we move on to the next verse? Well, He comes when you die. That's it. Yeah. You know what you're worried about. You, when you die, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So many people have put an emphasis on the second coming and trying to figure out when and when and when. But you know for sure it's coming when you die, um, uh, and, and you will. Yeah, Hebrews nine twenty one says it's appointed unto man to die once. Nine twenty seven. Sorry, uh, it's appointed unto man to die once and then judgment. Uh, yeah. Talking about the rich, rich, like the rich man. Who was storing up all these goods? Yeah, and he was not sharing it to the neighbors yeah. or whatsoever. And then God says, sold everything that you got to the world, but he didn't want to sell anything. Not the rich man, no. Not the rich. So the other rich people, did you see? They storing up everything for themselves. You see, the rich store up everything for their own self because they're not sharing it to others. Yeah. So it's it's not all rich people. God blesses some people with, with finances uh, to bless the body, um, but but yeah, a lot of people or, or many people that are, are are rich, you know, are oppressing others to become rich, uh, and they're oppressing many times God's people, um, and if they don't repent, um, God will have to condemn them because He's a good God. Let's move on to verse nine. It says, do not complain, brethren, um, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. 
Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. First read this. This, this kind of seems like it doesn't fit in. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't kind of go with these verses that we're reading. Um, but it actually isn't out of place. Um, what, what James is calling them to is, he's calling them uh, not to complain. Uh, and we see this in the book of James, throughout, throughout the book of James, right? He's, he, he's, he, says, uh, he says in James chapter 3, verses 4 to 5, he, he speaks on the tongue and how our tongue is like a, a small rudder. Uh, and if you don't control it, uh, it, it, can, it leads to destruction. Um, and then we also read in James chapter 4, Verses 11 and 12, it talks about not speaking out against the brethren, right? Uh, and I'm not going to go into it in depth because we, we kind of went through that. So, so this is kind, of, is kind of consistent with what James normally writes in his letter. And what he's saying is, uh, he's saying not to complain. And what do you think would cause these people to complain? Or, or believers to complain? trials right and and what happens when we're under trial what do we do we complain uh, and and anyone that's around us uh, they get the heat right our spouses uh, will we'll, we'll unleash our wrath and our anger uh, to them those, those the brethren around us you know if, if if it's not going well for us then it's not going to go well for anyone around me uh, and James is saying don't do this, right? Don't complain uh, um, against one another, right? And the word complain is to uh, groan or, or to sigh or to mumble, right? Uh, and it's usually, this, uh, this word is usually used as an expression of frustration from the people of God who are suffering oppression uh, and judgment. And we can see it in Exodus 2.23. It says, during that long period, the king of Egypt died. The, Israel's, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their, help, uh, and, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. Right? So the Israelites, they complained. They, they were a stiff-necked people to Moses. Uh, uh, and they complained against Moses for, for taking too, too long in some circumstances. Uh, and Paul is, uh, uh, James is saying, don't do this. Uh, when you're under deep distress, uh, when you're under persecution, when you're facing trials uh, by, by other men, uh, don't, don't complain against your brethren. Uh, it's not your brethren's fault. He, he, he's calling us not to groan against one another, not to mumble against one another, um, especially to, to, to those who are close to us. Um, so... James is telling us to refrain from this type of uh, this type of uh, <clears throat> expression or this this manner of uh, of living, this manner of conducting yourself, right? It says so that you your, it goes on to say that so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door, right? Here he's warning, uh, he's warning the this person of the the danger of judgment, right? Uh, we read in Matthew 7, 1, it says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Very similar to what Jesus taught James' teaching. Um, and I don't, I'm going to be honest, I don't understand this second portion of this verse uh, very clearly. There are a lot of opinions on, you know, being judged. I know your stance is that, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to, I don't know, what you, what is your stance on uh, being judged? What is, the second coming? A, as believers, uh, as on the second coming, yeah. how are how are Christians going to be judged? Yeah, well, we're not really judged in the sense of judgment. Our judgment has happened at the cross. But there'll be a vindication uh, for, for, you know, you know, the, the, you know, we will be vindicated and God will be vindicated for saving us. So it's not so, a, a literal judgment. No, we, we've been judged. We've been judged at the cross. There are so many people that a lot of Christians use that. 
they say don't judge unless you be judged. It's funny because there was a poem in Washington that said, he said, he said, don't, don't let, you know, people tell me don't judge unless you be judged. And I said, don't, don't twist scripture unless you be unseen. So there's a thing called that we can judge righteous judgment. Yeah, and, and I just think it's something else. Yeah. And so it's one of the most misused verses in the scripture with like Philippians 4, 13, I think, where it says, don't judge as you be judged. Just don't, don't judge motives. Don't judge, you, you don't know what motive and intent. Right? But if somebody's in, in a sinful relationship, you can make a judgment. You know, it says in John, judge with righteous judgment. You know, and so, so I don't know, I don't know what Glenn is feeling or what he's thinking. You know, I, so I can't make that judgment. But if I see him in doing something simple, I can make that judgment. I just wanted to say uh, that all my sins are paid for, past, present, and future. I have a wicked tongue. It's four ounces that tongue. Here's a verse that you go to, by the way, fellas. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things. If you have a child, you got to make that judgment on who that child's hanging around with. Every day you're making judgment. None of that stuff scares me. All my sins are paid for. I'm trying to be a holy man to the Yeah, it could also be like like if you if you're reading it as if the judge is Christ or God who's going to judge you if you behave in this manner. Um, that could just be kind of like a warning passage, like the passages in Hebrews, yeah. which are not saying. You know, you're going to lose your salvation and go to hell. It's just a warning to believers to kind of hold you in mind. So. All right, so First Corinthians, First Corinthians 11, he deals with that, right? There's, there's a misuse of the Lord's table. And, and Paul says, you know, because of, you know, they're, they're getting drunk and someone, they're not giving food to other people, and it's, they're, they're just sitting at the Lord's table. And Paul says, that's why some of you are sick, but some of you are weak, some of you even sleep. Then he goes on to say, and I can paraphrase it, basically that's a, a temporal judgment for, for sin. But you've been eternally judged already, because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, so we will have a father's chastisement, if you will, or judgment, if, if we sin here and now. Uh, how can we judge one another? If that person, how can we judge a person by themselves, knowing that he didn't do anything wrong or whatever? How can we judge St. Bruce? Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, see, I because, I'm sorry, Benny, you see, there's a pastor, I don't want to mention any names, that basically would say that every idle word uh, comes into the condemnation of the judgment seat. I would be there for a billion and a billion years if it was every idle word. You follow me? Benny, you yeah. hear what I'm saying? I hear you. Huh? I hear you. All my sins are paid for. <laughs> there's a few more, Bob. You follow me? I'd be there a billion years, so then the next person wouldn't have a chance to go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I uh, thank you guys for the input. I didn't want to say anything wrong, so. Um, no, it's, it's it's tricky. Yeah, it's hard. It's tricky. Do you know anything? That the judge is God. Yeah, the judge is God. Is God the judge? Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. That's the, the the main concept that we're getting in verse nine is that uh, that that there is a judgment, right? And and. And he's right at the door, so it's it's near, um, and and it's just a reminder, right? Let's move on to verse ten. As an example, brother, and of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, right? So, so here he James is returning to the topic of uh, focusing on patience during trials. And he's doing this by giving us a new perspective. And that perspective is to look at the, la the, the latter prophets, to look at uh, those who previously before us have suffered and, and were patient in their suffering. Um, and, and it says that they're an example. And they're an example because we can learn through these prophets and we, we, we can be spurred on to imitate these prophets, to, to live in the manner that they live. Uh, to, to, to endure trials, to, to be patient in trials, to trust in God, uh, to look to the second coming. 
uh, the coming of God. Um, so, so the prophets here are used as an encouragement. And we read in Matthew 5.12, uh, Jesus even re- reminds and, and brings up the prophets as, as an encouragement. It says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets uh, who were before you, right? They, they've been persecuted, we also will be persecuted. Um, so he uses uh, the prophets as an example. Now, can, can anyone think of some examples of prophets uh, that were persecuted and that endured and that were patient? Yeah. Well, uh, I want to be like Jeremiah because I want to be like the Lord Jesus. And uh, he was Ebed Melech. Uh, he was in that miry clay up to his neck. And they got those uh, dirty uh, rags and they pulled uh, him out of there. And also Jonah. Mm. Yeah. Um, Obadiah. Obadiah. And he was hiding, you know, all the other prophets and caves from Jezebel. Yeah. He was living in a castle or whatever it was. Is it Elijah or Elisha, one of those giants, had to run away from the king? Mm. Like, he was being pursued all over the place? Mm. By Jezebel, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, his wife was pagan, right? Anyone else? Daniel. Daniel? Of Dan and with the king of, of Rizika, and then like going through the lion's den and staying, continuing to stay in the faith when he was supposed to tell all the prophecies, interpret the dreams, but he continued to stay faithful to the Lord even through the actual physical trials he's put through. Amen. Anyone else? There are a couple more examples that we could find. Like Job, like <laughs> two lines down. Oh, Job. John <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, how was how was he uh, persecuted and and endured? Ah. Okay. Um. But on on that coin, David, uh, he was. He was persecuted by Saul, uh, and he endured trials. You read the whole book of Psalms, uh, and you see that. You see him constantly going to the Lord and, and crying out to the Lord. Who else? Well, in Acts 16, uh, the great apostle is heading for uh, Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit stops him. And uh, he goes to Lydia, and the heart is opened up. And then what happens, they beat his brains in. And uh, he's in stocks. They whip his back. He's in that jail. He is singing at midnight. And basically, that was it. The Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus said, you're going to write 13 books of the Bible, but what a job. Oh, boy, you know what's going to happen to you, Paul? Forget about it. This is what's going to happen to him. He was stoned. I don't know how he walked away from that stoning. It's unbelievable. Mm. All those rocks at him. He's like in there, and he walked away. Everything happened to him. Mm. Yeah. Um, anyone else have any other examples? And the scriptures are full of them. Yeah. And how David was the Lord commanded him, and it was a picture of, it was a picture of Israel, but, I mean, wasn't comfortable at all for him or, or something that he probably would have chosen for himself, but he was following the will of the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Um, all right. Those are all pretty good ex- examples. We have a lot. Uh, I mentioned Joseph. He dealt with the stick neck, a rebellious people, uh, uh, yet he was faithful, yet he was meek, yet he cried out to the Lord, yet he endured. Um I'm going to read a couple of verses from Jeremiah, because uh, Jeremiah is tremendous. You shall speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. And you shall call to them, but they will not answer you, Jeremiah 7.27. The wicked people who refuse, uh, to my, uh, who refuse to listen to my words, who walk in the s- stubbornness of their hearts and have gone off after other gods to s- serve them, 
and to bow down to them. Let them be just like waistband, which is totally worth it, worthless. Yet, uh, that's uh, Jeremiah 13.10. And then lastly, Jeremiah 17.23, uh, it says, Yet they did not listen or incline their ears, but stiffened their necks in order, in order not to listen or take correction. So Jeremiah was very similar in, in, in the people that he dealt with, uh, just like Moses. Uh, does anyone know how Isa Isaiah died? Cut in half. Cut in half, right? He was sawed in two. Um, um, any, any other? It doesn't say that in the Bible. No, it doesn't say it that in the Bible. Some, it says in the chapter of faith that some were sawed in two. But yeah. it doesn't say who. It's kind of like Yeah. But I go with what the Bible says. Okay. Uh, I won't argue on that one. Um, so, so, what James is saying, and what he's drawing us to, is to look toward these these prophets. Look at the prophets and how they endured, and how they were patient, and in, in all the oppression that they faced. Uh, and and notice the similarity in all of them is that they all cried out to the Lord. They all depended on the Lord. They all prayed to the Lord. They all sought of the Lord. Uh, and James is telling us, in the same way, uh, we need to, to be patient. Uh, the prophet suffered. Uh, uh, we also uh, will suffer. Uh, the, James 1 says that we will endure trials. Uh, count it all joy. When we, when, when we endure trials, um, or when we are faced with trials, and, and that means it's, a pl it's plural, which means it's multiple trials. It's not just one trial. We will all face trials. We will all be uh, persecuted uh, for Christ's sake uh, in different ways, but we will be persecuted. And during that time, uh, we ought to be patient. Uh, let's move on to verse 10. We count the blessing who endured. You have, you have heard the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion uh, and merciful. Um, and what made these the prophets and Job uh, blessed, right? It says, we count the blessed who endured. They're blessed because they endured. They're blessed because they trusted in Christ. We read in Matthew 5.10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, it says in 1 Peter 3.14, But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed, and do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, right? So, we all know, we all kind of know the story of Job. Satan went after Job. God allowed him, took his family, killed his kids, uh, took away all his possessions, his crops, all that he owned, severe disease, uh, and, and he didn't waver. He didn't waver at all. He endured, even though his wife cursed God, even though his friends... Uh, annoyed him and, and were trying to fa find fault in him, he trusts in the Lord, right? Uh, what, what were some of the things that Job said? I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen. That's what I holler in the street. Amen. Uh, what, what else did Job say? The Lord gives, the Lord gives and the Lord takes. Who am I? Blessed. Yeah, Blessed. naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Um, we also realized who God was after I looked around. Amen. Where, where, you know, God said, were you there when I laid the foundation of the earth? And he gave this whole couple of chapters of what he has done. Uh, Amen. And, and, uh, and then we'll, just because we're running low on time, uh, then the verse finishes off and it says that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Uh, and we see this evidence in the life of Job. What, what, what happened to Job in the end? Everything was, restored. Everything was restored, right? The Lord was merciful and compassionate. He honored uh, that, that Job was patient, that Job endured, that Job didn't curse him. Uh, instead, he confided in God. Uh, to get him through those trials. Um, so the point of this passage is looking to the Lord, finding our, our, our patience, 
putting our stronghold, like strengthening our faith in the coming of the Lord, right? Uh, if we think on the coming of the Lord, uh, we're going to want to live for the glory of God. We're going to want to be patient knowing that it's just for a little time that I'm going to suffer. And, and then for all eternity, I'm going to be delivered. I'm going to be in Christ's presence. I'm going to worship uh, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, and I'm going to be in His presence. Um, and, and, and as an encouragement, we ought to look at the latter prophets and how they suffered. Uh, and, and what got them through their suffering. What got them through their persecution. It's, it's prayer. It's, uh, uh, dependence on the Lord. It's crying out to the Lord. It wasn't. It wasn't men. It was. It was God. God carried them through. Um, and in the same way, it's it's God that's going to encourage us uh, to 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 continue to to be patient and to continue to endure and not to curse His name. Um, and all we got to do is look to the second coming. That's our blessed hope as believers. Uh, and those who don't have that blessed hope need that blessed hope. Uh, and we are the vehicle. We are the means that God uses. Uh, to bring the good news of this blessed hope that, that He has redeemed the people through the cross, uh, that He has resurrected, uh, and, and that men, sinners, can be forgiven of their sin uh, and can be made right with God. Um, so with that, I'll close this out in prayer.